Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar on how to get started with Amazon Web Services. I'm Adam Glick, and I work for Amazon Web Services here in Seattle, Washington. In today's webinar, we are going to talk about the following things. We'll cover the fundamental pillars of Amazon Web Services Cloud. We'll also discuss the typical progress we see organizations go through as they migrate to the cloud. We'll then spend the majority of our time actually showing you what you need to know to get started with AWS. And finally, we'll conclude this webinar with a question and answer session to help answer any of the questions you have after watching today's presentation. Let's get started. There are six fundamental parts of the AWS cloud. These fundamentals form the basis for all the benefits that you can achieve from Amazon Web Services. The first of these is a complete set of services. AWS first launched in 2006 and now provides over 30 different services to help you achieve your specific needs. From access to small amounts of computing power to large clusters, database services with SQL and NoSQL options, DNS, CDN, queuing, notifications, transcoding, deployment, monitoring, and much more. AWS even provides the ability to programmatically employ people for tasks that are difficult to automate. The second is flexibility. Personally, I always find it inspiring when I hear of all the different things that companies are doing with Amazon Web Services. We know there are a lot of great ideas out there, and we want to empower our customers to be able to do what they want in the ways that they want to do it. We've tried to make AWS as flexible as possible so you can use the operating systems, platforms, tools, and plugins that you want. We also give you root access so you can access any of the resources in the operating system. With a complete set of services and the flexibility to use those services however you want, we've been amazed at what our customers have come up with. The next fundamental is a global presence. Another core benefit of Amazon Web Services is the global presence that it provides. AWS has regions around the world so you can locate your applications close to your customers and in regions that make sense for your business. A developer in the United States could start operating in Japan and Ireland simply by changing a variable in their AWS code or clicking a dropdown in the AWS Management Console. This greatly lowers the barrier to starting operations in a new part of the world. Coupled with that is our next fundamental, it's the instant access to resources. An instant access to resources means that you can get access to everything in the AWS cloud without prior planning. With this immediate access to resources, we've had companies like Engage tell us that they've lowered their time to market by 90% by not having to wait for purchasing, delivery, and provisioning of new systems. Companies also avoid having to do capacity planning because more resources are always available when they need them. Another advantage of this instant access to resources is that they can be turned off when they aren't needed. This means you can size your infrastructure to the actual demand and scale it elastically instead of under or over provisioning. Combining the global presence of AWS with the instant access to resources means that going global is now something that can happen in minutes instead of months or years. AWS has a commitment to providing low-cost IT. Amazon Web Services works on a pay-as-you-go model. This means you never have to pay upfront for capital expenditures and only pay for the operating costs of what you use. This has been one of the things that our customers have told us was most beneficial to them. By avoiding the large upfront costs of creating new infrastructure, they're able to do more experimentation to optimize their businesses. In addition, one of the commitments AWS has is a belief that we can always help our customers by lowering prices. We've worked hard to find ways to lower our prices every year. We continue to take those savings and then pass them along to our customers. Our customers tell us that they love it when we lower our prices, and it's why it's part of what we do. We've done it dozens of times in the past years and will continue to do so. We are only successful when our customers are, and as we lower our prices, our customers have more money to make their business successful. That's a virtuous cycle that results in us seeing more business from what they do, so it's in our interests to help those customers grow their businesses. This is one of the great disruptive effects of the AWS cloud. We provide additional ways that we can deliver on lowering the cost of IT by providing ways to reserve the prices of your instances at a substantial discount, and that discount can exceed 40%, as well as tiered pricing, which enables bulk discounts in your purchase of AWS services. Finally, we look at how we can make our customers more productive. Amazon Web Services provides database services that can handle scaling of a database, backing up of data automatically, load balancing that automatically scales with your demand, storage that automatically handles redundancy, and many other features. We hope to make all of our customers successful, and part of that is empowering our customers to focus on what their core business is. We handle the racking and stacking of service locations, utility management, and much more, so you can focus on what makes your application great. These six fundamentals help AWS provide a broad set of low-cost services instantly available around the world. With these services, you have the flexibility to do what you want while avoiding the undifferentiated heavy lifting in your applications and infrastructure. Amazon Web Services provides a complete set of online services to enable your online business. We're not going to go through all the services today since there are over 30 of them, but I did want to cover the areas of technology that the services cover, as well as give you some examples. On the bottom of the 
stack, AWS provides a global infrastructure. This includes regions around the world and the power, physical security, and maintenance of those resources. The next layer is the networking layer. AWS provides networking services like virtual private cloud or VPC technology, and this gives you full address control of your environment. So if you want to use private IP subnets, for instance, you're completely able to do so. We also provide DNS services with product called Route 53, firewall controls with security groups, VPN connections, network load balancing services, a content distribution network, or CDN, called Amazon CloudFront, as well as other core networking services. The next layer is broken into three areas, compute, storage, and database. Compute is the computing power provided through EC2, or the Elastic Compute Cloud. These are virtual machines, or instances, as they're called in AWS, that you can run your application in. Storage is a set of services that provides ways for you to store your information. These are everything from hard disk services for your virtual machines to internet-connected storage with Amazon Simple Storage Service, or S3. It even has archival storage with things like Amazon Glacier. The database layer provides many different database services to meet your needs. The Relational Database Service, or RDS, provides relational database services using products like MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, and Oracle. AWS also provides a NoSQL option with DynamoDB. You have the access to large petabyte-scale data warehouses with Amazon. Amazon Redshift. The application services layer provides applications to aid common development tasks. These include a queuing service to help you create highly available queues to help with designing highly available applications. This service is called the Simple Queuing Service, or SQS. Likewise, we have a simple notification service, or SNS, that helps deliver notifications by email, SMS, or mobile app notification. There's also services for workflow, transcoding, outbound email, and many others. Finally, the deployment administration layer provides tools to enable you to handle management of your applications. Services like Elastic Beanstalk allow you to never have to worry about how to configure your AWS resources, while products like OpsWorks give you monitoring control and access to chef recipes for configuration. As you can see, there is a lot to the AWS product stack. We're not going to try and get through it all today. Today, we're just going to focus on the first parts of what you need to know to get started with AWS. When we talk to our customers, we typically see a pattern around how they adopt AWS services. It's not a blueprint for every customer, but it may be helpful in deciding what information and services are best for you to look into, as opposed to trying to learn everything at once. Usually, a startup will start with developers coding on their own machines. This is easy and fast, but makes it hard to share your code with others. As other developers need to look at the code, a server is sometimes used that is connected to an internet connection. This works fine for a few users working in shadow mode, but finds itself the whims of having a single machine plugged into a consumer internet connection, typically at an office or home. The organization usually grows a little more, and it's looking for something that's a little more ready for internal testing and demonstrations to select individuals like angel investors, venture capitalists, or important project decision makers. This is the time when many startups think about creating a server closet, using a co-location facility, or moving their operations into the cloud. Although you could move to the cloud at any phase listed here, we typically see organizations start in the cloud or move into the AWS cloud at this point, as they don't have to invest in new infrastructure and don't have to worry about having a high-quality internet connection, want some protection from localized challenges like theft, or spilling a cup of coffee on their production box. This webinar is focused on those that are in this stage. As the company grows more, the need for additional resources become more apparent. The easiest way to scale for many organizations that haven't chosen to design horizontally is to scale up. This enables them to handle greater numbers of users, but comes with some challenges around scale, cost, and availability. This will be covered in greater depth in the next webinar in this series. As growth continues, typically after a round of investment capital, the company looks at re-architecting for greater availability, better scalability, and to reduce their costs. We call this scaling out. Finally, the organization is growing quickly and has many resources to manage. At this point, deployment and resource management tools, as well as cost optimization tools and other high-level services aimed at helping manage, monitor, optimize, and run these services become employed as the organization looks to scale to meet the growing needs of a fast-growing user base. Since this is an introductory session, we'll be dealing with the people in the early stages who want to start using AWS. These would be startups looking to get started in the cloud and would be in the create, share, or deploy stages shown here. I did want to mention that if you would like Amazon Web Services to handle all of the deployment of your application for you, we provide a service called Elastic Beanstalk that will do that for you at no extra charge. Elastic Beanstalk enables you to take a Java, Ruby, Python, PHP, Node, or .NET application and have AWS deploy and manage it for you. It will automatically configure the servers the way that you want and scale the service as you specify. If you are looking to deploy your application and do not want to understand how to access the low-level resources in AWS, this might be the solution for you. You can learn more about Elastic Beanstalk at aws.amazon.com slash Elastic Beanstalk. Everyone who signs up for AWS is automatically signed up 
for the free tier. Everything we do today will be done within the free tier, so you can do everything you see today without any cost to you. Many AWS services are included in the free tier to help you get familiar with the services and let you try them out with your own code and use cases. You can find more information on everything in the free tier at aws.amazon.com free. Now that we've covered the fundamentals of the AWS cloud, let's talk about how you get started. I'll demonstrate how you can get your first virtual machine running. We call them instances. We've designed AWS to be secure by default, so I'll show you how you can open a port in your AWS firewall so that you can connect to your application. I'll also show you how you can use secured key pairs for connecting to your instances. You'll also see how to set up an email alert if your server is under high CPU load, and I'll demonstrate how to take a backup of your instance and how to restore that backup. We'll finish by putting a file in Amazon's simple storage solution, sometimes referred to as S3, and how to make that file available to anyone on the internet. Let's get started. The first thing that you need to do is sign up for an Amazon Web Services account. It's simple. Just go to aws.amazon.com and click on the Sign Up button at the top. You do need a credit card and be near a phone because we have a phone verification section. Let's walk through that process. Here, enter your email address. Now select, I am a new user, and click the Sign In using our Secure Server button. Enter your name, and then verify your email address by entering again in the second box. Select a password, then enter it again and click the Continue button. In your details page, enter your full name, company name, address, city, state or region, zip code, and phone number. Once you've completed entering that information, you can enter the verification number in the security check. Enter the letters that you see above in the picture. Make sure that you read the Amazon Web Services customer agreement, then select that you verify it and create your account by clicking the Create Account and Continue button. On the Payment Method page, you'll select what kind of credit card you want to use, enter your card number, cardholder name, and expiration date. Click Continue. For phone verification, we'll have the phone number and click Call Me Now. A phone call will be placed to you and you'll be asked to enter the PIN number that you see on the screen. Once you've done that, you can click the Continue button that will appear. Here you can select the form of support that you'd like with your AWS plan. We'll leave it as basic for now and then click Continue. You've now set up your AWS account. We'll go back to the home page, and then from there, we'll click on My Account slash Console and choose AWS Management Console to log in to our new account. Here, log in using the password you created at the beginning of this process, and then click Sign In using our secure server. There you go, you're into the AWS Management Console. If the virtual machine, or instances as we call them, you will be creating an EC2, will be using Linux. The first thing you will need to do after you've signed up for Amazon Web Services is to create a secure shell key or SSH key. Remember, this doesn't depend on what operating system you are using on your own computer. This is for the computer that AWS is going to be running for you. For users who will be using Windows instances in AWS, you do not need an SSH key as you will be using remote desktop and a login and password to connect to your Windows instances from your computer. You will, however, need a key pair to create your Windows administrator credentials, so you'll need to create a key pair in either case. For this example, we'll be looking at working with a Linux instance, and so we're going to create an SSH key. SSH key is help avoid weak passwords since the key used is much longer than most user passwords. If you want, you have the ability to import your own keys for use in connecting to your EC2 instances. In this demonstration, we'll be using the key pair generator that is built into AWS. We're going to start at the AWS homepage. From here, 
click My Account, and then select AWS Management Console. We'll then log in with the user we've created and click Sign In using our secure server. You're now at the AWS Management Console page. Click EC2 on the left-hand side. Here's the EC2 Management Console. We're going to check our region up in the right-hand corner. Here you can see we're in US West Northern California. You'll always want to make sure you're in the right region. The region that you choose isn't important, just make sure you're always in the same one. Then click Key Pairs. Here click Create Key Pair because we're making a new one, and make a new key pair called My First Key. Click Yes, and there you go. One thing that you should be aware of is depending on the browser and your operating system, the file that gets saved may be called different things. If you're using Chrome on Mavericks, for instance, it may say myfirstkey.cer, or if you're using Safari like we are here, you'll see in a second that it becomes a txt file. In some cases, it'll be a .pem file. The correct file extension is .pem, and so we're going to go into our terminal here, or if you are in Windows, you could do into your command prompt or your explorer window, and you'll have to go rename that. And so we're going to go do that, but be aware that you may see different file names, and that's just something that you may need to rename it based upon the operating system and browser that's downloading it. We'll go back to the dashboard, and then open up our terminal window. Here we go, and I'm going to go to my downloads directory where that was downloaded to. So in here, we'll do a directory listing. You can see that myfirstkey.pem.txt, again, because I mentioned that I'm using Mavericks and Safari. So I'm going to rename that to myfirstkey.pem. The other thing that we'll need to do is if you are using Linux or OS X, you're going to need to change the permissions on that file. So for instance, in this case, I'm going to change the permissions to 400. If you have permissions that are set too broadly, then when you're trying to make your connections over SSH, it's going to tell you that you have an overly permissive access and you won't be able to access it. So it's very important that you change these. Windows users won't run into this because you use directory permissions, so it's a little different. But if you're using Mac or Linux, make sure to do this chmod 400 and then the name of your key file. And there we go. We've set up our key pair. Security on the internet is always important. To help ensure that your resources are secured, AWS automatically starts your resources without any connection enabled from the internet. Much like an internet firewall, security groups allow you to choose which ports are open to which IP addresses on the internet. You can specify a range of ports as well as a range of addresses to give you full control over what ports are available and where the connections can come from. In this demonstration, we'll create a new security group and open port 80 used for web traffic, or HTTP traffic, as well as port 443, which is used for secure web traffic, or HTTPS traffic, and then port 22 for SSH access, which is used in Linux for us to be able to access the command shell, and port 3389, which is used for remote desktop protocol, or RDP, when connecting to Windows-based instances. In this example, we'll be opening each of these to any internet connection, though for your own work, you may want to limit your RDP and SSH connections to just your personal IP address. This section is very important as one of the most common problems users sometimes face is not having the right ports open or not having the right IP addresses allowed through those ports. A good example of this would be if you enabled only your own personal IP address to access your instance, and then your internet service provider or ISP dynamically gave you a new IP address, or you went to a new location. This is not untypical for personal internet accounts or people who are working on laptops that move around from internet connection to other internet connections. Now let's see how to create and configure a security group. From the AWS Management Console, select EC2, and then here we're going to check our location. Again, we're still in Northern California. We always want to make sure we're in the right region that we want to access and click Security Groups from the left-hand side. Notice here the default security group is already there, but we're going to create our own by clicking Create Security Group. Give it a name like My First SG, and you can give it a description of anything that you like. VPC underneath it has to do with Virtual Private Cloud. Leave as a default for right now. We won't get into that today, so it's okay to leave it as default and things will just work as you expect. Click Yes, Create. And this creates our security group. You can see it highlighted in blue at the top. We're going to expand the bottom section. So we expand that out, and here's where we set the inbound and outbound rules. Now I mentioned things are secure by default, so you notice there's no connections that are allowed in yet. We're going to add one for SSH, put that in there. We'll talk about sources in a second. We're going to add the rule, and you'll notice that changes haven't been applied yet. You have to click Apply Rule Changes, and they'll change from 
blue to white over on the right hand side when those are applied. Go in and add one for HTTP, and then we'll do the same. We'll go in for HTTPS traffic that probably would go in and out of our server. And then finally, in case you wanted a security group working for your Windows folks, you could choose RDP as well. So we'll select RDP, all the, add all those rules, and then once we're done with that, we can go and apply our rule changes. Now, I want to talk for a second about sources. So for ease of this demonstration, I've chosen you know 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0. So basically, it's open to the entire internet. This is not a good security practice. It's good for HTTP and HTTPS because that's your web traffic and you probably want to be available to all of your customers. But for things like SSH or RDP, which are typically used for administration, you're going to want to lock those down. Now you can use ranges with CIDR rules or even direct IP addresses here. So whatever your personal IP address is, you could type that in here and that will mean that even if someone had your key or had your password, they still couldn't get in because you've actually locked the firewall. So this is a very important security setting to do. However, for me to do it here, you would see an example that would just be my IP address. So I'm doing zeros, so it just makes it very easy for people to see. But it's important that you know that you're going to want to lock those things down and not leave them wide open. That's not a good security practice. It's just kind of a getting started thing that I put here. And with that, we can go back to the regular AWS console. We've set up our first security group. Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud, also called EC2, gives you the computing power available on demand in the AWS cloud. The AWS instances, which are similar to virtual machines, give you the ability to run the operating system, platform, and tools that you want. You get full control of the resources and administrator or root access to the instance. You can choose the processing power, memory, and hard disk space that you need. There are even instance types that give you access to special graphics hardware if you require it. There are many different configurations you can choose from. In this example, we'll be creating a T1 Micro Amazon Linux instance. We'll pick the hard drive space, as well as the SSH key that we'll use for access, and the security group we want applied for access. We will then start the instance and take note of the address of this instance on the internet so we can connect to it later. Let's get started. From the AWS Management Console, select EC2. The EC2 Management Console, again, make sure we're still operating in our same region. In this case, we're using Northern California from US West. Select Instances on the left-hand side. You can see we have no instances running, so we'll click Launch Instance. Here you can see all the different virtual machines that you could choose from. We want to stay within the free tier, so we'll click the free tier box, and we're going to choose Amazon Linux. You could take a look at your other AMIs you have, ones available in the marketplace or community. We'll just start with something simple. Amazon Linux version, we'll leave it a 64-bit and click Select. Now on this next screen, you can see what kind of instance you're going to launch, indeed how, what size the machine is. We're using the free tier one, so it's a micro, but you can see there's many other options if you need more memory, more compute, just a larger box in general. We'll stick with the micro instance. From here, we could just review and launch, but I want to show you how to step through the whole process. And so we're going to step through the next processes. When we launch our next instance later on, we'll just click on this to kind of skip through it. But here we'll choose Next Configuration Instance Details. Here you see lots of things you can set. You can choose the number of machines you want to launch, in this case, one instance. Don't worry about spot instances. It's a different way to pay uh, for things. It's a spot, kind of an open market. Same thing I mentioned the VPCs before, just ignore that for right now. You're going to start in your own addressing space and don't need to worry about the subnetting for that because of it. There'll be a public IP that's applied. Don't worry about IAM rules or shutdown behavior. Again, these are things you can get into later, but they're permissions-based things. Um, same thing with CloudWatch, we'll do that later. So just move to the next one, add storage. You can see we start with 8 gigabytes of standard storage. Uh, for this instance size, you can go up to 30 in the free tier. You can also choose provision IAPs if you want. That allows you to select a specified number of IOPS that you get um, and have that be consistent. That's a paid for option. We'll leave it with standard, move on next, and we'll give this a name. Like uh, my first instance for this, you can add up to 10 tags here. So this is the name tag. We're just adding that. Click next. Here you're going to see you could set up a security group here like we did before, but I wanted to show you where you could create your own. So we'll select the existing one we already created. Go ahead and tick the one next to my first SG and click review and launch. Here's where you can review. Um, all the information that you just selected. You'll notice the warning at the top because we had that security group that was open to the entire internet. And I mentioned that's a bad security practice. So there's a warning here that lets you know that you're doing that. You can see it's a T1 micro instance we talked about, the naming for that, which security group, and click launch. Now here's where you select your key pair. So go ahead and select the key that you created earlier and tick the box that acknowledges that 
yes, you know that you have that key pair. Remember, if you lose that key, that private key, there's no way for you to get it back again. Click Launch Instance, and your instance is on its way to launching. So let's take a look at viewing our instances, and you can see that that instance, the My First Instance, is starting up right now. So we'll wait a little while, and that will spin up and start. Once that's done loading, it take, can take a little bit, it depends, for that to be running. But when you do that, then select the instance here, and we'll go look at the properties of it at the bottom. You notice this public DNS part, I'll highlight it here. This is going to be important for us to connect to it later on, so just make a note of that. It'll be here later if you want to look at it, but I just wanted to call it out in specific. Um, you can also see that it passed status checks. You'll notice that it starts running and then it goes through two status checks. We'll go back to the main AWS console, and we've launched our first instance. Previously, we created an Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2, instance. Amazon Web Services provides the flexibility to run the software you want using the tools you are most familiar with. This means you can connect to a Linux instance using any terminal program that supports SSH. There is a Java-based terminal that can be used by anyone who has a browser that supports Java. This is what we'll be using in today's demonstration. If you would prefer to use an application on your personal machine, you can use Terminal on Macs running OS X or PuTTY on a Windows-based PC. Please note that there are some additional steps to using PuTTY under Windows as you need to convert the .pm SSH private key file to a .ppk file. If we had created a Windows instance in AWS, we could connect from remote desktop or Microsoft Terminal Services client from a Windows-based machine or 2x from a Mac running OS X or a Linux machine. As a reference, I'll cover how to do each of these. To connect to a Linux instance from Mac OS X or a Linux PC, just open a terminal window and type ssh-i, then the location of your private key that you downloaded, this key usually ends in .pem, and then ec2-user, which is our username, the at symbol, and then the public DNS name of the instance we want to connect to. We are logging in as ec2-user, which has administrator or root permissions. For security reasons, we don't log in as the root user, though. Once you are into your instance, you are free to change the root account and change access in any way that you wish. In general, it's not recommended that you log in as the root user. If you're using Windows and do not want to use the Java-based client in the AWS EC2 console, you can use PuTTY. You can download PuTTY for free from the link listed here. You will need to convert your .pem key file that you downloaded earlier to a .ppk file. You can do this using PuttyGen, which comes with PuTTY. You will then need to create a connection in PuTTY. There are a number of steps in this process. Detailed screenshots of this process are available in the version of this presentation that is posted on the internet in the AWS SlideShare location located at www.slideshare.net slash Amazon Web Services. You may need to search for this particular presentation as many of our presentations are posted there. If you're connecting to a Windows instance from a Windows PC, you can use Remote Desktop. To make your Remote Desktop connection, press the Windows key and the R key at the same time. You can also press the Start menu and select the Run option for the menu if you're using Windows XP through Windows 7. In the Run box that appears, type mstsc slash v colon and then the public DNS name of the EC2 instance from the Details section of the AWS EC2 Management Console. You will see a window appear asking for your username and password. Use the username and password you were given when creating your AWS instance to connect to your Windows EC2 instance. In this example, we'll be connecting to the Linux EC2 instance that we created earlier. Let's get started. From the AWS Management Console, choose EC2 to go to the EC2 Management Console. From here, make sure you're in the right region. We're still in Northern California and select Instances. Here, we can see our instance, so we select the instance we want to connect to, and then that public DNS address that I mentioned before. I'm going to grab this and copy it, because I'm going to show you how to connect through Terminal, and then we'll do the Java client. I open up my Terminal program here, and I'm in Terminal. So I'm just going to do ssh-i. Now I'm going to give the directory where I located my key at. Remember, I put it in my downloads directory. So that, and then my PEM file, so myfirstkey.pem. And then our username, so ec2-user at, and here I'm going to paste in that public DNS address. So I do that, and I connect, and you may see a couple of warnings that come up. That's okay. I'm also listing to show you there's nothing in the directory now, and I'm going to open up Vim. Vim, it's a text editor if you're not familiar with it, and I'm just going to create a new file. You'll see why in a second. So here I'm just going to create a file. I'll say hello cloud, because our first server in the cloud. And then I just go in, I hit escape, colon, and WQ, and that writes it to the file. So you can now see that it's there. So we've gone and created that. I'll close that out, use Control-D, and then close the window. Now I want to show you how to connect through the Java client. 
So I'll click connect, but if you're using Safari on Mavericks, you need to go and change your security permissions. So if you go into security permissions and manage websites, make sure you select Java and then console.aws and amazon.com. And you need to choose run in unsafe mode because otherwise the Java client is blocked from accessing your key. So we go, we select that, and now we can connect. Otherwise you'll get a connection error after you go through this process. Say Java SSH, and I'm gonna give the location where my PEM file is again here. You'll notice the username is already defaulted to the correct username of EC2 user. So users, Adam, downloads my first key.pem. And I made a couple of mistakes with my slashes here, so I'm going to go back and change them. But we'll go and put this in for our private key. And then we'll click the launch SSH client button here. Now, I'm running in full screen mode for the browser, so because of the way the Java client starts, I'll flip back. You'll see in a second here that I'll, I'll flip back and I'll have to come back in order to be able to get access to that window. Um, if you weren't running in full screen mode, it would just show up on the window that you're seeing here, but I wanted to make sure you could all see my full screen. So there we go. We saw it pop up. It takes a second for the JVM to start. I accept the user license. It needs to create a couple of directories, so I let it create those directories, and it's from an unknown host, which is okay. I say yes, and I'm connected in. And this is a terminal, same thing. You'll notice if I do a list of the directory here, you can see that file that we created. You can see it's the same file. So I'll close our connection here and close out our connection from the EC2 console. And from here, go back to the AWS Management Console. And that's how you connect to your AWS instances. CloudWatch is a service that provides monitoring to your EC2 instances. CloudWatch also allows you to take action on those monitors. You can use CloudWatch to notify you about the state of your instances, as well as scale out or in your application. You can use metrics like disk I.O. per second or IOPS, network throughput, CPU utilization, and many others. CloudWatch helps you define when you want the system to take certain actions on your application as well as when you would like to be alerted. In today's example, we'll only be running one instance, and so we'll be setting up a CloudWatch alarm to email us if the CPU utilization of our application goes over 80% for over five minutes. This way, we'll know if our system is reaching its limit, and we may need to look at scaling up, which we'll deal with in the next webinar in this series. We could also use this to set an alarm if your server becomes unresponsive, so you would know if your application crashed or was not available for your users. Let's go set up a CloudWatch alarm. In this example, we are going to create a CloudWatch alarm that will send us an email if the CPU utilization of our instance goes over 80% for longer than five minutes. This will be useful to know if our service is under heavy load and we may need to increase our resources or look into a product bug. Let's get started. From the AWS Management Console, select CloudWatch. Here's where we can create a new alarm. So we'll select Create Alarm, and for viewing, we're going to choose EC2 metrics. Now there's a lot of metrics here. You can see our instance ID. We only have one, so it's easy. And we're going to choose CPU utilization. You can see a graph in the upper right of what it might look like. There's also things for like status failed check, which would be interesting to see if it has failed. Click continue. We're going to give this a name. I'll say high CPU greater than 80. And give it a description. This is where you can put out a plain text description of it. I've got one that's in my cache here. Um, and then we're going to set the settings here. Here it's greater than or equal to 80% for five minutes. Click continue. Now here we want an alarm to go off, so we'll select action type. We're going to send a notification, and we're going to create a new email topic. I'll give it a topic here. So very simple, high CPU 80. And then I'll give it an email address, in this case, uh, my email here at Amazon.com. Click Add Action. You can add multiple actions if you like, and then click Continue. It's important for you to know that when you're setting up CloudWatch alarms, you can set a number of them for free, but if you set the frequency to be very short if you want frequent alarms or you set a lot of alarms and specialized alarms there are costs for those uh, but the one that i showed you today a cpu with a five minute interval that one you can have as part of the free tier and so when you're going and setting this up for testing use that it's also important to know that when you look at these there's two ways that you can primarily use it when you're starting out so high cpu will let you know if your server is getting hammered or if there your code might have a bug in it that's causing it to to run the processor a lot and that'll give you an alert about that before your site is down. The other one is that if there's a status check, you can set up a status check. Basically, it's a ping between the service and your server to see if it's alive, kind of like a heartbeat. And you might want to set that one up just to make sure that your server is still responding to things. So in either way, you would get an email that would be sent out to you. Along with that, 
the email address that you specify will get an email saying that it's been added for an alert if you haven't done it before. Once you've done it once, it'll, it'll remember that setting. But for the first time, it will send an email to that email address. You'll have to go open that email and click on it. So if I went to my email box, I'd see that email there. I'd click on it, and then it says, okay, I can send these notifications. But obviously that's set up to make sure that people don't spam email accounts that aren't theirs. Once you've done that, it gives you a chance to review what you have and then click Create Alarm. There you go. You will have created your first CloudWatch alarm. And then we go back to the EC2 Management Console. From the AWS Management Console, select CloudWatch. Here's where we can create a new alarm. So we'll select Create Alarm. And for viewing, we're going to choose EC2 metrics. Now there's a lot of metrics here. You can see our instance ID. We only have one, so it's easy. And we're going to choose CPU utilization. You can see a graph in the upper right of what it might look like. There's also things for like status failed check, which would be interesting to see if it has failed. Click continue. We're going to give this a name. I'll say high CPU greater than 80. And give it a description. This is where you can put out a plain text description of it. I've got one that's in my cache here. Um, and then we're going to set the settings here. Here it's greater than or equal to 80% for five minutes. Click continue. Now here we want an alarm to go off, so we'll select action type. We're going to send a notification, and we're going to create a new email topic. I'll give it a topic here. So very simple, high CPU 80. And then I'll give it an email address, in this case, uh, my email here at amazon.com. Click add action. You can add multiple actions if you like, and then click continue. It's important for you to know that when you're setting up CloudWatch alarms, you can set a number of them for free, but if you set the frequency to be very short if you want frequent alarms or you set a lot of alarms and specialized alarms there are costs for those uh, but the one that i showed you today a cpu with a five minute interval that one you can have as part of the free tier and so when you're going and setting this up for testing use that it's also important to know that when you look at these there's two ways that you can primarily use it when you're starting out so high cpu will let you know if your server is getting hammered or if there your code might have a bug in it that's causing it to to run the processor a lot and that'll give you an alert about that before your site is down. The other one is that if there's a status check, you can set up a status check. Basically, it's a ping between the service and your server to see if it's alive, kind of like a heartbeat. And you might want to set that one up just to make sure that your server is still responding to things. So in either way, you would get an email that would be sent out to you. Along with that, the email address that you specify will get an email saying that it's been added for an alert if you haven't done it before. Once you've done it once, it'll, it'll remember that setting. But for the first time, it will send an email to that email address. You'll have to go open that email and click on it. So if I went to my email box, I'd see that email there. I'd click on it, and then it says, okay, I can send these notifications. But obviously that's set up to make sure that people don't spam email accounts that aren't theirs. Once you've done that, it gives you a chance to review what you have, and then click Create Alarm. There you go. You will have created your first CloudWatch alarm. And then we go back to the EC2 Management Console. In this demonstration, we're going to take a look at the EC2 hard drive, we call it an EBS volume, and create a backup of that volume. We'll call it a snapshot. This will be helpful in case something bad happens to our instance, and we need to bring back a saved snapshot of our EC2 instance. Let's get started. From the Management Console, select EC2. Go in here, make sure as always to check our region, and then click Instances. Select the instance that we're interested in, and uh, you can see this is my first instance. Obviously, we only have one at this point. And then go take a look at your volumes. Now, if you take a look at your volumes, again, there's only one, so it's easy. But when you have uh, multiple machines, it may be a little more challenging. And notice here in the attachment information, you can see that it's attached to my first instance. You also have a volume ID. So that's what we want. Select Actions and Create Snapshot. Snapshot's just a backup. Give it a name. How about my first snapshot? And then give it any description that you like. And once you're done with that, just click Yes, Create. Now it's starting to create that. In order to see it, you need to go over to Snapshots. So on the left-hand side, we'll select Snapshots. And you can see that my first snapshot is being created. It says Pending. When it's done, it'll be green. Say Completed. Like that. And that's how you create a snapshot. I do want to take a second and talk about snapshots, because there are some important things to know about them. One, when you're using EBS volumes, it's usually a good idea to make sure that you have separate volumes for data versus operating system pieces. In this case, on a micro instance with one drive, you'll be fine. But just when you think about building larger applications, remember to keep your data volume separate because you're taking a backup of not the operating system itself, but just the data pieces of it. It's also good to know that if you take multiple snapshots from a particular volume, it'll be a differential backup. And what that means is it doesn't need to take an image of everything there, but simply everything that has changed from the last time you took a snapshot. 
So this time it'll take everything that we've done, in this case, that one text file that we created, and then every change that we make after that will only be the differences between the two. And that helps save you some, some space, obviously, because these snapshots that you take, they're stored in your S3 bucket. You can't see it there, but that's actually where it's stored so that you're aware of that. And now we'll go back to the management console. EC2 instances use Amazon Machine Images, or AMIs, to boot from. You can choose from many public AMIs for most popular operating systems, or you can define your own. Defining your own can be useful because you can define a base image for your applications. You can create as many of them as you want, though the images are stored in Amazon's Simple Storage Service, or S3 for short. The S3 copy of your image is private to your user, though you can choose to share it publicly if you wish. Many AWS partners also make AMIs available for their software to make starting up their software package easy and avoid installation processes. In this demonstration, we'll take the EBS snapshot we had taken previously and convert that into an AMI, then start a new instance with that AMI. Let's get started. From the AWS Management Console, choose EC2. Here, make sure we're in the right region. Again, we're still in Northern California for this example, but any region would work. Select Instances. You can see there's the one instance running, which is the one that we created previously. We're going to select that and take a look at one of its properties. Now, when we go down, we'll expand this up, and we're going to take a look at the kernel ID. So it's important to make note of this. I always remember it's F77, ends in B2. Now we'll go to our snapshots. You can see our snapshot here. We're going to create an image. Don't create a volume. That'd be like another hard drive. Create an image. Give it a name. Whatever name you like is fine. So you can give it a description. Whatever description you like is fine. Remember, these just help you find them later if you have multiples of them. Change the architecture. We chose a 64-bit, so we have to choose 64-bit. Otherwise, we won't see the right kernel ID. We find the kernel ID that matches, and we put that in here. It's very important. Choose Create, and now the creation is happening. It's pending. So if we go take a look at our AMIs, we can see there's now an AMI, or Amazon Machine Image. Now we select that one. We can see the status is available, so it's already ready for us. And then we want to go, and we want to launch an instance from that. So we're going to launch. In this case, we're going to stick with a T1 micro, part of the free tier. And I said before, we won't go through all the steps. We're just going to do the review and launch the easy one this time. We're going to stick with the default security group. And as you can see, you know, there's the warning about being open to all. It's only opened uh, SSH or port 22 in this one. We'll choose launch. We'll select our key. It's easy. Again, it's the one key that we have. Tick the acknowledge box and click launch instance. It'll go and launch, and if we look at our list of instances, you'll see there's now a second instance. There's no name because we didn't give it a tag, but it'll take it a second to start up, and once it finishes starting up in the example here, we can go and take a look at it. So you see we're going to have two instances that are running. So once it finishes initializing, we'll select it so that we can find out the information about it. Go up, go up here, I'll click on it, and then we can see our public DNS down at the bottom. We're going to highlight here for a second. So if you wanted to connect through terminal or through PuTTY, you could grab that information. In this case, I'll just use the built-in mind term, the Java client that we used before. Go up, I'll click connect. We'll go in, we'll select the Java client. Now you notice the username changed, so we have to change it to the one. In this case, remember, ec2-user is the default username, so it wasn't root. Always make sure you fill that in. And the path to our private key that we downloaded. Go and put that in, still my downloads directory, my first key, and click launch SSH client. So again, we'll have to wait, pop back and forth to get it. It's a new machine, so it doesn't know the fingerprints. So we have to say, yes, we want that. We'll look in the machine, and if we take a directory listing, we can see, yep, there's the file we did as part of the backup. There we go. So we'll close this all down. And that's your creating a uh, restore of a backup, creating a new machine from backup that you had. In this case, we're going to go and terminate that instance so it doesn't keep running, so you don't get billed for running two machines. We say, yes, we're going to terminate. We know we're terminating it. And so it'll start shutting it down. It'll do that in the background so we can go back to the regular console. And that's how you restore an image.
Amazon Simple Storage Service, sometimes referred to as S3, is an easy way to store files on the internet. Amazon S3 is highly scalable, so the files you post on S3 will be highly available as well as highly durable. Amazon Web Services stores multiple copies of your file in different geographically separated locations, so your data is always available to you or your customers when you need it to be. You can store files that are any size from one byte to five terabytes in Amazon S3. S3 also provides 11 nines of durability. That's 99.9999999. 999% durability, so you can have confidence that your files are always going to be there. AWS provides encryption of your files to protect against unauthorized access, as well as in transit when they are being transferred in or out of the S3 folder. We call them buckets. All of your storage is separated by region, so you can choose the geographic location where your data is stored, and you have the granular permissions control so you can control who can access each file in your bucket individually or as a group. S3 also allows users to access your content via the APIs and web-based requests. Web-based requests can also use the built-in web server, so S3 can serve up static websites like content images, videos, documents, and even HTML, JavaScript, and CSS files themselves. In this demonstration, we'll upload a new image file to an Amazon S3 bucket. We'll then set the permissions on that file so it'll be publicly available on the internet. Finally, we'll access that image via web browser to prove that it's available over the internet. Let's get started. Here we are at the management console. We'll click on S3. Here, the first thing we'll do is create a new bucket. We need to give it a unique name, and that name needs to be unique for all users across AWS. In this example, I'll choose my username, demo user first bucket. No one else has ever used that name, so it's available. I'll click on that and open that bucket. Think of this as a directory where you can put files. I'll click Upload and choose a file to upload. I click Add, and I have an image file that I want to upload. But this could be any kind of file that you like. Once I've added all the files that I want, click Start Upload, and the upload will begin. You can see the status on the right-hand side. Everything's done uploading in this case. Let's select our file and then look at the properties of it. Here, you can see the URL where this file would be available on the internet. Let's click on that to see what happens. As you can see, access is denied because by default we don't make it available to the public. Let's change that. We're going to have our file selected, and then we're going to go and choose permissions. You can see that I have access already to open it, view it, and to edit it. We're going to add more permissions. For the grantee, it's who we want to give permissions to. In this case, it will be everyone. So we select everyone, and then give them the rights to open, and download, and view, but not to edit. We'll then save these permissions. Now that we made that change, let's click on the link again and see what happens. As you can see, now it's available on the internet for anyone to be able to see. In this example, we used an image file, but if you wanted, you could use HTML files, JavaScript files, or any other common static website files. This is a great way to have a static website as well as to store other files online for access either by everyone or by setting permissions for particular users. In today's webinar, we've seen how to sign up for Amazon Web Services, create an SSH key to connect to a Linux instance, configure a security group to enable access to our instance. We've created an EC2 instance and connected to that instance. We've set an alarm to notify us if our instance has high CPU load. We've also backed up an instance and done a restore of that backup. And finally, we put a file in S3 and made it available to the internet. If you are interested in learning more, you can sign up for more webinars at aws.amazon.com slash about dash aws slash events. Thank you for your time today in watching this webinar. I hope it helps you in your exploration of using Amazon Web Services. You can also follow Amazon Web Services on Twitter. We're at AWS Cloud. You can also join us in our forums at forums.aws.amazon.com. With that, I'll now be glad to answer questions in the time we have remaining.